Between Love and Faith <clears throat> has been a major piece of work undertaken over the past couple of years. It was commissioned by the House of Bishops. The whole College of Bishops has been engaged in the process at very regular intervals throughout this work. It has, though, involved around 40 people from a wide range of disciplines and a wide range of views, working in small groups and together to produce the book, which was published last Monday. The book <clears throat> is now commended by all the bishops for reading, study, reflection and discernment. It has been a very major task. <clears throat> no other church has sought to produce such a thorough study with all the background papers and work being made available for people to read and study further if they so wish. Some of our colleagues in Durham University have contributed to the process. The book is offered primarily to the church, but it is hoped that it will be found to be a valuable source for people from all faiths and none in exploring issues of identity, sexuality, relationships and marriage. It is certainly not a short book at 468 pages, but it has been really well laid out in a good sized font. So I'm going to so to give you a feel. There we go. Um, <clears throat> so it is easy to read and follow. For those who value these things, it has extensive indices and endnotes. It's filled with stories alongside the teaching, learning and discursive materials. It does not have to be read from cover to cover as sections and chapters can be read alone. Although overall, reading the whole is beneficial to understanding each part. After a forward by our two archbishops, there is an invitation from the bishops. The book is then in five parts, each broken up into several chapters. Part one is called Reflecting, What Have We Received? Part two, Paying Attention, What Is Going On? Part three, Making Connections, Where Are We in God's Story? Part four, Seeking Answers, How Do We Hear God? And part five, Conversing, What Can We Learn From Each Other? In between each part, there is a section entitled Encounters, which contain people's stories. They are an important part of the whole. The book closes with an appeal, again, from the bishops together. Taking part in the process through listening to debates between people with differing views, reading drafts of the book, several drafts, it has to be said, and seeing it change, develop and mature have actually been a great privilege. I've learned much personally along the journey. Every single one of my Episcopal colleagues says the same. We have all learned. We have all been changed in differing ways. The book does not seek to offer definitive answers. It is offered for study in a period of discernment which will lead to proposals in due course. But no one knows what those proposals will be because there is a genuine desire to seek to hear God together. In order to help with this discernment process, it's hoped that individuals will read and reflect. But the main encouragement is for people to do this together in small groups. Primarily, it's hoped that this will be done at parish level. But there are a caveat here. It is hoped that people will make every effort to take part in groups where there are differing views held so that real listening to one another can take place. So there might be real benefit in parishes working together to create some such groups. In order that a wide range of people take part, the book is not the only resource available, although it is the core resource. So Keith, could we have the, um, the diagram showing the various materials? There is a course designed for small groups. This is helpfully entitled Living in Love and Faith the course. It has five sessions and there's a leader's guide to assist. Then there are 17 story films, each about four minutes long. These are testimonies of Christians own stories of marriage, celibacy, being transgender, same sex couples, intersex and so forth. They are simply told as stories for people to watch and listen to. There are 15 podcasts covering discussions held between different members of the LLF team. I have little doubt that many organisations will also produce their own materials to, to assist further with the thinking. 
Although I want to say that the LLF materials themselves need to be the core of all group work if we are to truly do this as a discernment process together. Thank you, Keith. One of the key things that emerged very early on in the process was the work that the separate pastoral advisory group did on pastoral principles. Keith, could you take the thing down, please? These are designed to help us behave well towards one another as we engage in listening to one another. Matters of identity, sexuality, relationships and marriage are ones on which everyone has opinions, often strong ones. So reaching a position of understanding each other, even if still disagreeing with one another, is not easy. The pastoral principles have already shown themselves to be very valuable amongst the bishops themselves. They are commended as the principles by which everyone operates in LNF groups, and indeed more widely in how we treat one another. The pastoral principles in headline are to address ignorance, to acknowledge prejudice, to admit hypocrisy, to cast out fear, to speak into silence, and to pay attention to power. So, how are we going to approach this in Durham? First, I am arranging to purchase a copy of the book for our stipendiary, SSM and House for Duty clergy, plus our lay chairs and lay members of Bishop's Council. These will be with you before Christmas. You can download a PDF from the LLF website, but I generally think this is one of those occasions where you will find having the physical book very helpful. If you wish to buy your own immediately, then do so and pass the gifted copy to a church warden, a reader or someone else you think will read it attentively once you have it. I will be appointing someone as LLF advocate. Each diocese is doing this. There will be a small group who will help us to run things across the diocese. However, because of the work around Black Lives Matter and issues of racial justice, we want to encourage delaying setting up small groups on LLF until after Easter. A course for Lent on Black Lives Matter is being put together by Remy Omelet, working with a few others. There is a second reason for the delay. We really hope that these LLF groups will be able to be done face to face. And realistically, this is more likely to be possible post Easter. We will hold a session on LLF as part of this synod meeting next May. We are asked to feed back our discernment nationally by November next year. So during the autumn, we will find a way of bringing all that is emerged from parish groups together to see what we can formulate as a diocesan response. It will be very important for the process that follows nationally that our general synod representatives are significantly involved in hearing this. I note that there are elections for a new general synod to be held next summer with that synod meeting for the first time in November 2021. Although the earliest any proposals will be put, brought to that synod is February 2022. In conclusion, I hope this has offered you a clear outline of the living in love and faith process. It was not my purpose today to do anything other than outline the materials and the process that lies ahead. And I want to conclude using the prayer at the close of the opening invitation in the book, but would add that the text of this introduction will be available on the diocesan website for any who wish to follow it further. So let us pray. O Holy Spirit, giver of light and life, impart to us thoughts higher than our own thoughts and prayers better than our own prayers, and powers beyond our own powers, that we may spend and be spent in the ways of love and goodness after the perfect image of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>